Instead, I'll just give a, a brief uh, description of Pat. Uh, he is uh, best known now, of course, as founder and CEO of Impossible Foods, a company that went from you know having what seemed a, a somewhat austere product in a, in a really short amount of time is now everywhere, including your local Burger King. And, um, but Pat uh, is um, Professor Emeritus of Biochemistry at Stanford. He, uh, where he was a um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator for 25 years. He's a member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine, and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He has too many awards and accolades to go through here, but I will give one special mention, a fairly recent one as it's germane to tonight's conversation. And that is uh, in 2016, the World Economic Forum named Impossible Foods a quote, technology pioneer. Uh, and in their citation said that the company uh, is poised to have a significant impact uh, on business and society. So it's that impact uh, we'll be talking about uh, tonight. And so welcome, Pat, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. It's a pleasure. Um, so I'm always curious whenever I talk to a scientist or a physician uh, about the backstory. So what kind of propelled them or, you know, uh, move them to do science uh, or medicine. And I'm curious in your own case, what's your story? Is there anything in your uh, childhood or youth that kind of predisposed you to doing science? Um, I don't think there was any event in my childhood that predisposed me. I think, you know, I have the phenotype of a lot of scientists, which I've, I'm naturally curious. I'm naturally uh, not kind of suspicious of and not likely to be compliant with authority and conventional wisdom. Um, I was uh, not the kind of student you, you would want in your class when I was in um, K-12, um, let's say disruptive and probably had ADD, I don't know. But, um, but yeah, no, it was just like, you know, I was always curious. I was always wanting to try to understand things I didn't understand and, and you know, create things that I didn't know how to make and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's yeah. just my but, phenotype. So in the event, you, um, you ended up at University of Chicago and you actually somewhat unusually got all four of your degrees there, uh, uh, undergrad, master's, MD, and PhD. So you must have, there was something special about University of Chicago, I guess, or what was... Uh, some well, I chose to go there because, you know, it actually is a really good academic institution, and it's, it's very kind of, like, friendly to quirky geeks like me. And, um, and it's a liberal arts college. So I did not want to go to any kind of a specialized school. I wanted, I didn't, I didn't go for a BS in any specialty. I switched majors. I was, I started out thinking I wanted to be a mathematician, which I, which I would have loved to do, except that I sort of came to the conclusion, even though I think math is incredibly important and beautiful for the world that it wouldn't have the kind of impact on humanity that I wanted to have. And so I switched majors a couple of times and wound up getting a BA. And meanwhile, you know, spent a lot of time studying history and literature and all the other stuff you do at University of Chicago. So that's why I made that choice. And I definitely don't regret it. it's a great place. I always, people ask me if it's a good place for kids to go. I would say, yeah, really good choice. But it's I stayed there basically for, um, oh, sorry. When I was applying to you know medical school, I applied to a handful of places. Nowadays, when people apply to school, like they, you know, when I applied to college, I applied to two, two places. When I applied to medical school, I applied to, I don't know, like four or 
of graduate school and stuff like that. Nowadays, I think it's more common to like do 50. But, um, and uh, I was rejected by Stanford, which would have been a, a place I would have considered going. Um, I've forgiven them since. Um, they didn't even interview me actually, shame on them. But, um, but no, it was a, a, I got into the MSDP program at, at Chicago. I was very interested in being a scientist. I was also interest, very much interested in medicine, just learning about medicine, learning about human biology. And also I thought it might be one, uh, a way that I could, you know, use my things that I'm good at to really make a difference for people. And, you know, I actually, after sh Chicago, I did three years working as a pediatrician at a children's hospital, not really doing research, but just taking care of sick kids, which I loved. I thought it was, a, you know, but I just thought I could, you know, the problem is when you're taking care of sick kids, um, sometimes you you have someone that you desperately want to help that's sick and you just don't know how to do it because we haven't solved that problem. And that was a big part of why I decided to, you know, get out of clinical medicine essentially and, and just go back to, um, you know, doing basic research, which I felt like you could net have a bigger impact, even though it's, it's less viscerally rewarding in real time. It's, you know, better, uh, potentially you, could have a bigger impact. And when you did that, you, um, you came here to the Bay Area to mm -hmm. the Bishop and Varmus lab. And mm -hmm. I would think that would have been sort of a heady time in the sense that they were just a couple of years away from winning the Nobel was the, for the, their discovery of proto-oncogenes. Was there a sense in the lab that there was a Nobel or was that a surprise? <laughs> That's a funny question. Well, you know, you know, they were in this category of people where they were sort of always in the, there was buzz about them getting a Nobel Prize and so forth. And, and people were, you know, I guess there was that sense. It definitely wasn't like something that people thought about more than once a year, probably. But, um, you know, they were obviously had huge scientific accomplishments and, you know, they're, discovery of proto-oncogenes was, was, you know, a really highly impactful discovery while worthy of recognition. But um, yeah, I don't know. It was a great time. To, they were great. They're great, both they were, they are, um, you know, great human beings and great scientists. And they create a great scientific environment in their labs. And, you know, it was an awesome place for anyone who, any scientist, any young scientist to, to spend time. So you, uh, you'd been studying in that lab, the uh, retroviruses, I gather, and when you moved to Stanford, continued that. Um, but I guess became fascinated with genomes and the information those might hold for um, understanding a lot, including disease. So you, in those days, um, devised the DNA microarray, and you've said in interviews that you essentially had the whole thing kind of built in your head right down to the fluorescent polka dots that cover those things before you even built a prototype. So well, what was that like? Um, well, you know, at the time, um, so, so I was, you know, working, studying how retroviruses replicate and particularly how they integrate their genes. And, uh, and it was a great problem. It still is a great problem. And, and I got into it because when I was a pediatrician, I was starting to see patients in my last year uh, with uh, HIV. It was just at that time. And um, no one knew how they integrate their, their genomes into cells. And I thought that was a great problem and it might make a big impact if I could figure that out. But, but once that, you know, and, and it's still, you know, like there's tons to learn about retroviruses still. It's like an incredibly rich, rich area right now. But, but at the time I realized that 
um, you know, there were no genome sequences. It was sort of in the very early days of really trying to understand the, you know, uh, sort of structure and organization of genomes at the molecular level. And, um, but, you, but you could tell it was coming. And, um, and I was interested in, in um, basically it started, I was interested in human genetics and, and I, uh, the tools for, for doing uh, genetic mapping in those days were, were very primitive um, by today's standards. And, um, and I just, I had an idea for how to do a high resolution whole genome genotype it's, it's a somewhat arcane story at this point, but it was a biochemical method for, for basically selectively isolating the, the portions of genomes that two individuals share, okay? Um, and, um, and it worked and I tested in yeast and it worked and so forth. But I wanted to be able to kind of read it out at high resolution at the whole genome level. And although the genome sequences didn't exist, there were at that point reasonably complete libraries of sequences that that would, you know, cover whole genomes. Um, again, not 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 fully developed, but but they were on their way, and you knew they were coming. And also, I knew because at the time there were there were um, uh, active genome sequencing projects, including at Stanford. Um, that you know it was just a matter of a couple of years before before you had the whole sequence, and so I I thought okay well if you can select out just the parts of the genome that two organisms share, you know, uh, and you, you want to know exactly where they map to the genome, if we could just um, you know have a basically an array the whole genome represented in an orderly way. Um, uh, on a on a solid substrate, you could you could identify them by just hybridizing to that, and and you know biochemically you could do the calculations. You you it it will work, um, and um, and then the colors basically um, because there's there are extrinsic factors that that affect the you know the sample of the DNA that you're isolating. Um, you want to factor them out. You know, you want to have an internal control, and so the two colors are just basically giving, giving an internal control. Anyway, blah 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 blah. It's it's a little bit in the weeds, technical details, um, and um, so yeah. So the idea of you know what this thing should be, and the colors were basically like a lot of scientists. I'm very visual, and I care a lot about like whether intentionally or not, the aesthetics of an experiment. I'm still someone having run like 10,000, you know, DNA gels in my life, probably more. I still get a little bit of a thrill when I look at, you know, the glowing bands and, um, and all of that stuff, because, you know, I don't know, it's just the, the, I love the aesthetics of, visual aesthetics sometimes of experiments and I care about it. So, I wanted to design it in a way that it would be pretty to look at. Why not? I mean, it comes for free if you design it that way. And so that was why those particular colors for me were, were um, you know, chosen as, as the output. But anyway, that, that's, yeah. So I sort of had the idea, but having the idea doesn't mean you have the thing. And so that was, you know, that, that took work. I had a really smart engineering student working on building the robotics and stuff like that, and then turning that into a, uh, a really robust system, you know, where one of the core principles was the, the device and the whole way of doing this had to be really cheap because you wanted um, anyone in the lab to not have to think twice about doing using this as an experimental tool. Um, it, it, you know, because like, if, 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 if things are expensive, you just aren't gonna, you're not gonna be able to do discovery research. You're gonna be like agonizing over every little experiment. So a lot of it was also, we wanted to have a, a, a system where we could crank out a bunch of these things and they'd be cheap. They'd be like five bucks a piece, you know, to make. 
anyway, that was that was uh, and and so there was work involved in that. Actually, the uh, um, uh, he's not here, but the guy who runs the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub at UCSF, Jody Risi, was a grad student in my lab, and actually he um, it was after we'd already kind of developed the basic technology, but he took it, you know, to the next level by really, you know, optimizing the the robotics and and a lot of the um, did a lot of the early experiments that we did with it and so forth. So just a shout out to, to Joe on that. Um, but then as once we had it, um, it was, you know, or once once I started thinking about it actually, by the way, and then I wrote a grant to do this and it was rejected and I got the absolute worst priority score I had ever seen in my life, not just the best one, worst one I'd ever gotten. It was, it was like, not only didn't they like it, but they hated it. Um, and they were, they didn't like the fact that I wasn't a geneticist, so you shouldn't even be trying to do genetics because you're a biochemist. Anyway, that's just a whole nother story. But, um, but the, uh, yeah, once you start thinking about it, you realize, holy cow, there's so much interesting stuff that either naturally does or can easily be adapted experimentally to map back to the genome, to tell you both about the genes, about about how they're regulated, even what what they do, you know, just just what um, uh, what they what the function is of the protein they encode, and um, you know all sorts of stuff. So that you know was like as soon as we were kind of on that path, we realized this is this is like um, you know a whole new. It's like a it's like a window into the cell and into the into the brain of the cell that you know uh, you can just go wild doing experiments with. And just one more kind of jog from the path before we get into uh, um, impossible burgers. You also. Um, at a certain point, I think it was the late 90s, you, I guess, became exasperated with scientific publishing and with Harold Farmas and others founded PLOS. And, you know, nowadays we're used to different publishing models in science with preprint servers and open access journals, et cetera. But at the time that was pretty gutsy, uh, especially with global and very well-heeled publishers standing in opposition to this, uh, that you must, the, I'd be interested to know what that, you know, felt like to kind of step out on that, uh, step out on the edge of that cliff. Well, I didn't feel like an edge of a cliff. First of all, the, the way I got into it was I sort of backed into it and I, I got, I, I realized this was something worth doing, but the reason that got me to realize it was one of the least important reasons for doing it. So uh, I realized that when we were doing a ton of experiments with microarrays looking at all sorts of, uh, um, you know, uh, the whole genome of yeast, the whole genome of, of uh, or, you know, a, a best approximation, the whole genome of, of human cells and how they behave and how they react and, and kind of like the, the script they're writing for each cell under all kinds of conditions and stuff like that, it was gobs of data. You know, you have thousands of whole genome measurements under thousands of conditions. Each of the gene, gene, genomes has thousands and thousands of genes. You have millions of data points. And, and each one of them is full of information, but to be able to, to make sense of that, you want to, it, what it does is it, it maps, it makes links between genes and links between genes and, and phenotypes and links between phenotypes, you know, all those things uh, are represented in that data. But the, the, the information that is being synthesized there is all over the scientific literature, you know? And we were literally, we'd like, oh, we do an experiment. Now, I, now we're racing around reading papers about everything we know about this physiological state and everything we know about all these genes that are behaving in an interesting way and stuff like that to try to 
you know, synthesize that and, 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 and make discoveries, it was incredibly inefficient. And so I thought, oh, okay, here's a no brainer. We're just going to basically write a script to, to sort of scrape the literature, um, you know, with respect to all the, all, all the relevant uh, kind of term, you know, links, terms and stuff like that. Um, and then, and then build a system for, you know, synthesizing that information based on, based on the results of these experiments, right? And uh, seemed like a no brainer um, uh, until the moment I realized that you can't do that because all that literature that comes from the work of scientists who just want to give away that knowledge to the world, they make, including me, by the way, up until then, make the mistake of thinking when they give it to a publisher, the publisher sees their job as making it as widely available to the world as possible. And at that time, more and more, probably the majority of scientific journals were already online. And the incremental cost of an additional reader is zero. Um, and yet the publisher's business model meant that now their job, instead of disseminating the literature, is to restrict the dissemination of literature, the exact opposite of what society and scientists um, expect and want them to do, okay? So I kind of backed into it through this weird channel of having data that I wanted to kind of analyze by synthesizing published data and realizing the whole publication system was completely effed up. And, um, and that it wasn't just that my experiment, and I'm sure lots of other people's, you know, scientific research is actually being impeded by the scientific publishing industry. Um, but I also realized that actually, if you're not at Stanford University or some elite institution that spends, you know, millions of dollars on journal subscriptions, all of that literature might as well not exist for you, even though it can be freely available on the web. And effectively, it, it is the very people who are paying for the government-sponsored research, if their mom gets breast cancer and they want to, they or their physician wants to look up what is the state of the art in you know, managing this disease or whatever, they quickly realize that, well, you're gonna to have to pay like 30 bucks a pop or more to read through 100 papers, most of which are garbage, um, before you can, uh, um, you know, actually benefit from the research that your tax dollars paid for. So at that point, I was just infuriated, and I just thought the system is just like these guys are evil. And by the way, they still are. The people, the non-open access publishers, I think they're completely antisocial. They're they're doing exactly the opposite of what society expects them to do, and what and their obligation to science. And so it became much more than just, okay, an inconvenience to my research. And, um, and I just decided, okay, I gotta do something about this. So, you know, first thing I did, Mike and I, well, actually I wrote it on, the, on, the, on, on, on a flight home from uh, Washington, an open letter. Well, actually the first thing I did, this is more related to UCSF. Harold Varmus was the director of the NIH at the time, and he's, you know, a, a wonderful person and a, 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 a was a good, he had been my postdoc advisor, along with Mike. And, and so um, he was in San Francisco uh, for a day. I met him at the, probably non-existent now, but the Tassahari Bakery that used to be on, um, I think on uh, Cole Street and, and Parnassus, I think. But anyway, uh, um, and I told him, you know what, this is something the NIH has to do. He wasn't, you know, he, like me, like most scientists at the time, had no idea that the system was so screwed up. And, and I, you know, the NIH uh, could do something great by just creating an open access repository. And at the time, I thought, no brainer, mandate that any NIH grantee um, deposits their published work in this repository. So at least if, if, if you know, if some burger flipper at uh, uh, Burger King paid for the research and, uh, you know, they want to read about the latest scientific discovery, they, they, they actually have the ability to do it. Anyway, Harold, uh, um, you know, embraced that idea 
And that led to, along with David Lippmann, who was, uh, uh, was then the head of the NCBI. And, um, and we kind of, over a period of a month or two um, of like daily email exchanges, concocted the idea that eventually involved into PubMed Central, which was the first you know, publicly sponsored open access repository. And then we realized, this is why I was flying back from Washington, that the way it had to work because of the politics and you know the publishing lobby and all this nonsense, that unfortunately, if you're ahead of the NIH, you have to care about politics and lobbyists. Um, they, um, it had to be, it wound up that it, this repository was voluntary. Publishers only had to participate and share their, their stuff that they publish if they did so voluntarily, which not surprisingly, none of them did, okay? Except for two of them, PNAS, which was at that time, the, the editor-in-chief was my former graduate advisor, Nick Cazzarelli, who was also a wonderful guy and a mensch. He's passed away, but, but um, and the other one was molecular biology of the cell, which, um, but they were the only ones that did it. And, and so, um, so on the flight home from our meeting about PubMed Central, I wrote an open letter and, um, and first thing I did was I went to my colleagues at Stanford, all, the, all my buddies at Stanford, uh, including everyone in my department. Um, and, uh, and I asked them all to sign it, which they did on paper. I have nice images of these things. Uh, then I sent it to, um, uh, to Joe, to circulate, Joe DeRisi, to circulate to a whole bunch of faculty people in his department at UCSF. They all signed it. Um, and uh, Mike Eisen, my, a former postdoc who is a professor at Berkeley, he circulated with his buddies at Berkeley. So we had like a few hundred signatures. And then uh, Mike suggested oh, we just got to put this online. And so we created a uh, website called Public Library of Science, which was, which was the term I used in the open letter and solicited signatures. And by, you know, I don't know, several months later, we had like 30,000 plus signatures from 109 countries of scientists who basically pledged, we are not going to cooperate with the, the non-open access journal system anymore. We're not going to edit for them. We're not going to review for them. Uh, we're not going to subscribe to those journals, and we're not going to submit papers to them anymore. Okay, great. Except, and so this, I thought this is definitely going to be convince the publishers that this is what scientists want, their constituency, and they would come around and do the right thing. But nope, they're evil. So, um, so at that point we realized, okay, well now we kind of have gone on a limb and we've asked a whole bunch of other people to put their names on paper saying that we're not gonna participate in the system and effectively cut off their channels for publishing their work and all this sort of stuff. And so that's when I decided, okay, we've got to start a publisher, an open access publisher. And, uh, and that's where Public Library of Science, the you know, nonprofit open access publisher came about. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's that's how, that's how I got there. It was, in fact, it's related to Impossible Foods because basically the idea is the way to the way to, to get these guys to stop being evil is to compete directly against them and show that there is a business model for open access that's better than what they do, and that you know, uh, um, and start you know stealing their customers. It hasn't. It still hasn't entirely worked. It was, but but I'd say at least at this point, anyone who found a non-open access journal, you know, is going to have a trouble looking, looking themselves in the mirror these days. So after, uh, after that, in two thousand nine, I believe you had a sabbatical. And after having done all these things, you decide to take stock of your career and where you want to go next. And you, mm -hmm. like many others, conclude that climate change is the scientific problem of the scientific challenge of our time. And given everything you've done in, uh, in science and <laughs> maybe um, 
involuntarily in publishing. Why the food system? Why did you choose the food system as the place where you would try to make your uh, contribution? Yeah, well, um, I didn't do a sabbatical to take stock of my career. It was just that, you know, I've in it, I don't consider myself to be locked into any particular box of professionally. And that's why for me to do, um, you know, public library of science, even though I didn't know squat about publishing or starting a business, it just seemed like, and I think a lot of scientists feel this way. Oh, it's just another thing that I don't know how to do that I'm going to try to figure out. And, um, but anyway, um, I just thought, okay, well, I have, you know, I have some time in the administrative teaching responsibility. I'm going to spend some time talking about, uh, thinking about um, what's the most Im impactful thing I can do next? What's the most important problem I can contribute to solving? And I didn't automatically assume it was climate change, although I assumed it was going to be one of the big global environmental threats. And relatively quickly, as I started educating about this stuff, I realized that, that um, you know, the, there's a million reasons why that industry has to go down. But the two biggest environmental threats of our time, one of which is climate change, everybody recognized that. The other is a catastrophic collapse of global biodiversity, which many scientists recognize, but the public is not very aware of. Probably a greater threat to our planet and to humanity's future than climate change. But it's not a competition, they're both terrible. And it turns out that the answer to both of them to my surprise, actually, I, I mean, in retrospect, I feel like, duh, um, is the use of animals as a food technology, which is by far the most destructive technology humans have ever invented. And it is the most destructive technology on earth today. And replacing it, which is far more feasible from an economic disruption standpoint and from every standpoint we can discuss this, than you know, electrifying the economy and decarbonizing the power system, which is incredibly capital intensive. There's huge inertia uh, economically and, and physically. Um, that, that it should be possible to replace that industry in a relatively short period of time. And I also realized that you're not going to do it by government regulation, any government that tried to tell people what to eat to be out the next day. And, uh, and you're not going to solve it by education, because as by that time I knew, um, you know, even the most ardent environmentalists are having a steak for dinner. And it's not like they're too stupid to understand that this is not the wisest thing to do from an environmental standpoint. It's just that they're so habituated to what they eat and so forth that uh, they just don't want to hear any, any uh, dissent there. So that meant that the only solution is actually what was the easiest one anyway, which is to realize that the problem is it's a ridiculous technology and it's incredibly inefficient, not only in resource terms and, and you know, destructive to the environment and so forth, it's economically inefficient. You're, you're, you're doing this crazy inefficient thing of, of you know, converting plant protein to animal protein with a like low single digit percent efficiency and that also translates into economic inefficiency and so forth. And the technology is fundamentally unimprovable. It's maxed out. Um, you know, there's really no fundamental improvement. Yeah, you can make them get fat faster, but there's no fundamental improvement in, in that technology in millennia. And, and as a biochemist, I thought, duh. I mean, we ought to be able to do better. And it's not a solved problem. I don't know how to do it but I know this is solvable. And, um, and if we could do that and just compete in the marketplace, the most subversive, it was the same thing with PLOS, the most subversive institution on earth is the free enterprise system. If you can take something you want to accomplish with a global impact, you know, for whatever your motivation is, and you can figure out how to make it happen by, by um, creating, uh, creating something that consumers prefer, nothing can stop that, you know? And uh, so that's why I decided, okay, I've got to start a company. I've got to um, figure out how to make the most delicious, nutritious, and the, you know, you can, you can meet all your nutritional needs for a fraction of the cost of a mainstream Western diet. 
using an entirely plant-based diet. Um, that problem was solved. It's just that nobody wants to eat lentils and tofu and quinoa um, instead of a steak. So the hard part was figuring out how to take those cheap, scalable, um, uh, nutritious plant ingredients and turn them into a form of food that consumers not only love and think is delicious, but they think is delicious as meat and more delicious as well as healthier and better value than uh, anything the animal-based technology can do. Anyway, that was the, what we took on. So Impossible Foods was founded actually as a scientific organization that happened to be an embryonic company. And we approached the problem as a technology platform problem. We don't want to reinvent the chicken nugget. We want to reinvent the technology by which we turn plants into meat and milk and fish and stuff like that. And the products, you know, will follow. So that's, that was, that was, and so, yeah, I raised money, started the company, hired, you know, the best scientists I knew and I knew lots of very smart scientists or I did couldn't hire every best scientist I knew like Joe unfortunately already had a job that he loved, but, um, but the best scientists I could uh, I, I could hire, and they were incredibly good. Um, and we just started working on the problem. It seems like in the case of the Impossible Burger, in particular, one of the first linchpins was heme, right? Uh, figuring out that heme, which is ubiquitous, in both you know attaches to it's part of hemoglobin, but also found in plants, and you figured out that it is responsible for a lot of the sensory experience in the realm of taste anyway, mm -hmm. uh, but also in appearance uh, in beef. Um, can you say a little bit about, uh, on your website, there's almost like a scientific love letter to meme, a uh, heme, <laughs> a heme meme, as it were. Well, we should all be grateful that that molecule exists because every living organism on earth essentially depends on it. It's not just um, you know carrying oxygen in your blood, which is the most familiar thing I think to most people. You know, it's it's the catalytic element of you know it, it's probably the uh, overwhelmingly most abundant cofactor for enzymes um, across you know all of life. It's an essential component of the um, sort of electron transport, the res the respiratory chain that uh, um, all you know aerobic organisms depend on for survival. So it's it's like incredibly important biomolecule deserves uh, you know there should be a national holiday to celebrate it just for that. But um, the thing that that uh, uh, had not been known, and it's kind of amazing that it hadn't been known. Um, it gets to how how complacent the food industry actually is, but um, is that it's the catalytic element that is responsible for flavor. And that was something I suspected early on, even before I founded the company, I was just doing a little, you know, kind of poking around experiments in the lab and even, you know, uh, one with one of the first things I did with respect to, to um, a heme protein is I knew, di I didn't discover this, it was known that legumes um, have this uh, or, or, organ called the root nodule that is a little kind of a little bump on their roots that uh, um, gets colonized by symbiotic bacteria and fixes nitrogen. Okay. And, and, um, and inside that nodule, there's a high concentration of a heme protein called leg hemoglobin. Okay. And it's there to sort of buffer the oxygen concentration and so forth, but um, uh, not directly involved in nitrogen fixation, but creating the environment for it. And um, so I already knew that just, I don't know, I, I learned about it in college or something, but, but uh, when I started thinking about why is, why is meat so unlike broccoli, you know, it's, it's, you know, you put broccoli on the grill and it gets mushy and, and hot. You put meat on the grill and it completely transforms chemically. You know, the flavor profile goes from being sort of bland and bloody tasting to, you know, incredibly complex and in minutes. And, and in the process, you produce this explosion of aroma that's not present in the raw product. 
that's kind of created in real time. You don't get that with any plant products. Why is that? Well, you know, you just look at things we call meat. They're all red or pink, okay, in the raw form, right? It's screaming at you. And heme is one of the best biological catalysts known. And that phenomenon that you get when you're, you know, uh, cooking meat is just screaming that there's a catalyst in there somewhere, okay? That, um, and um, so I suspected, you know, early on that it was probably heme that was, you know, at least had an important role in that, that dramatic phenomenon. Um, it turned out it was more important than I suspected, but I figured that we got to look at this because I think it's going to be really important to get, to get that, you know, total dichotomy from plant products to meat products to be on the meat side of that. Um, um, this catalyst is probably going to be important. So um, actually like a, a year and a half before I found the company, I, one, one winter day, I went out to a little clover patch that's, um, on a hill outside where my house is um, and uh, started picking clo clovers, our legumes, pulling a bunch of clovers out of the, the ground, looking at the little tiny root nodules, cutting them with a razor to make sure that they were really bright red inside, which they are, it's very dramatic. Um, and, uh, and then gathering a bunch to kind of grind up and isolate the protein and so forth. Because at that time, I thought that's how we were going to get a heme protein without using animals is, oh, we're going to get it out of, of root nodules. And I calculated that the amount of like hemoglobin in the world's root nodule population was greater than the amount of myoglobin in all the meat consumed globally. So bang, it's done. We just have to figure out how, how to harvest these suckers. But anyway, but then the real, you know, the, the what my um, R&D team figured out is, a lot more about the chemistry, okay? Number one, that heme is actually responsible for an overwhelming majority of the unique flavors. And you can take vegetable broth and put a few drops of heme in it and cook it, and it doesn't taste like vegetable broth, it tastes like beef broth, okay? So that's kind of how dramatic the impact of, of uh, heme as a catalyst uh, is. And this was something that, that they, from the, from the experiments they did to look at the whole chemistry of it, uh, discovered all that. And also what are the substrates that, that you know, get turned into these aroma and flavor compounds by heme and, and how to adjust those concentrations to tune the flavor profile and, and stuff like that. But um, yeah. Now, and it's, it will take that kind of thing, as, as you say, to convince people and make them move. And you recently published a paper with Mike Eisen of UC Berkeley in PLOS Climate. Um, and you make some bold claims there that essentially if we eliminated ag uh, animal agriculture, we could sort of get halfway in, uh, in one fell swoop to where we need to be to uh, keep things within two degrees Celsius. Um, and um, you, you, I think you brought a couple of slides that. Sure, okay, yeah, I can, I can quickly share them. Did, did, you, did you want to say more or ask more questions or I can just quickly flip to them because I know we're short on time. Um, so let me do that. Uh, hang on a second. Uh, I guess, I guess one question I have is, you know, you, you do see trends, you, as you said, a government is unlikely to do this. We do see trends where Epicurious, a major source of recipes has not, is not putting beef recipes up anymore. And uh, 11 Madison Park in New York, which has been called the best restaurant in the world in 2017, took, uh, took meat off there. They have a plant-based menu now. Um, um, so it does seem that there is, there is movement here. Yes, there is movement. Um, and, you know, I think it, it absolutely should be celebrated. Um, the, uh, I'll, I'll get to the slides in a second, but, um, the, um, the thing is that no one, no one, uh, seriously believes that 
um, you know, there are lots of great restaurants that serve plant-based dishes that as far as I'm concerned, I'm, it's, are delicious. I haven't eaten meat for 45 years and um, I have no problem having a delicious diet that's made entirely from plants and uh, independent of impossible foods, okay? But the vast majority of people who are habituated to meat and they love meat and can't imagine a meal without meat and so forth are not gonna go to, first of all, they can't afford to go to Five Nights. I, 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 that, that, that chef is a great guy. I'm, I'm a huge admirer of him and, and other chefs that are doing this, but that's not gonna solve the problem, okay? And, and in fact, the fraction of the population that is voluntarily vegetarian or vegan has barely budged in recent years. The, the level of interest is higher. Uh, there are more, there's more curiosity and so forth, but you're not gonna get there by just waiting for people to make that choice deliberately. Um, uh, anyway, um, so, so- If you I could pick maybe true. one or two slides that are the punchiest, we could then go to questions. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah, I think uh, I'll show one slide about biodiversity because I think people don't fully realize how absolutely at the center of the biodiversity crisis um, this industry is. Basically the collapse of biodiversity is to first approximation entirely due to our use of animals for, as a food technology. The, the, the global populations of mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish are less than a third what they were 50 years ago. That's very well documented. For fish, it's overfishing, okay? Pretty much full stop, using the animals as a technology for food. For terrestrial species, it's almost entirely habitat destruction and degradation uh, by virtue of the fact that the land footprint of humanity, more than 80% of it is animal agriculture. And that's growing every day, as you can tell from the smoke rising from the Amazon. And, um, and the growth of that huge footprint, 45% of the entire ice-free surface of Earth, land surface of Earth, is the problem for biodiversity on land. And just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the, the weirdness of it, the total mass of cows living on Earth today is more than 10 times greater than the total mass of every living terrestrial wild vertebrate left on Earth, okay? We've essentially crowded out nature with cows. Okay, so get done with that. So here's the, um, the climate business. And I can just maybe put this in presentation mode just to go through this. And this is from the paper that Mike and I published um, uh, a few months ago. Basically what we did was he took data from authoritative public sources, from IPCC, from NOAA, um, from basically all the kind of like serious objective people who collect data on climate and climate mechanisms and, uh, and the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, which is I would say the most authoritative and, and uh, um, unbiased in a sense, sources of information about the global food system. And we use that to ask a question that had not really ever been asked before, which is, which is, what if we turned off animal agriculture? What would happen to climate? Okay. Um, rather than talking about what are the steady, what's the steady state impact, which is huge, but um, it's what would happen over time if we turned it off? And what we found was that um, in in this chart, let me just see. I can, hope I can. Point. Do you see my pointer? Well, anyway, the solid line is the trajectory we are currently on. Best guess from you know various organizations that sort of project where we're going climate-wise. By the way, this trajectory will well before the end of the century get us to something like 2.8 degrees or more uh, above um, pre-industrial times, which is like so far beyond the irreversible damage zone that, that we don't even wanna talk about, okay? But this is the trajectory we're on right now, hopefully not forever. Um, the dash line is the trajectory we'd be on if we could phase out animal agriculture over the next 15 years. And here's the mechanism. Um, the land footprint of animal agriculture, there've been a number of publications, some of them dating back to even like 20 years ago, that have tried to calculate how much biomass was lost in clearing land for agriculture in general or for animal agriculture in particular. And the best guess is it's equivalent to, it's uh, uh, about 800 gigatons, which is equivalent to about uh, uh, 20 
two years of uh, fossil fuel emissions at current rates, okay? That could be pulled back. And, up, and think of it this way, that's 800 gigatons of, of CO2 that could be captured. The total amount of CO2 fossil fuel emissions in history since pre-industrial times is 1,650 gigatons. So, so 800 gigatons compared to that, it's a huge amount. And unlike fossil fuels, the emissions from animal agriculture are re historic emissions are reversible almost entirely. You can't turn carbon dioxide back into coal in any practical way at any practical scale, but you can turn it back into plant biomass. And, and all you have to do is get the frigging cows off the land and, and let the ecosystems recover to first approximation. So that's that green sector. That's the recovery we get from from uh, you know, plant biomass ecosystem recovery on the land, massive amount of land used for livestock today. The, the, the purple is methane decay. So two of the major greenhouse gases from animal agriculture are methane and nitrous oxide. Animal agriculture is responsible for about a third of global anthropogenic methane emissions. And the overwhelming majority, possibly 90% or more of anthropogenic nitrous oxide emissions and both of those gases decay spontaneously, unlike carbon dioxide, which, which means that when you turn off the spigot, you, the, the levels in the atmosphere don't just go flat, they go negative, okay? So when you turn off the spigot from animal agriculture, you immediately unlock negative greenhouse gas emissions, i.e. reduction in atmosphere of greenhouse gases from the decay of methane and nitrous oxide. And you can, you can calculate the magnitude of that and of the biomass recovery. And you add that all up and uh, project over time and you get, this is what we would trajectory we'd be on if we could phase out that, that animal agriculture globally over the next 15 years, okay? Um, and it, like I said, gives us a period starting as early as 2030 or so, if we did it linearly over 15 years um, of effectively net zero emissions, like, actually a window of opportunity for us to get, you know, scalable, decarbonized power system up and running. Um, and through the end of the century, if we did nothing else about, this is assuming we do nothing else about all other greenhouse gas emissions, you get a 30 year pause and you offset um, uh, about um, uh, almost 70% of, um, all other greenhouse gas emissions through the end of, of uh, the 21st century. So that's a big deal. And this is basically just showing if we could do something else that people talk about, but nobody seems to be actually making any progress on it uh, or not at anything close to the rate we need. If we could fail out phase out fossil fuels by 2050, we could actually turn back the clock on climate change by, that won't turn back the clock on climate change, but at least eliminate that source of new emissions. But um, combining with phasing out animal agriculture, we could actually turn back the clock, reduce greenhouse gas emissions back to where they were pre 21st century, okay? So this is all possible. And, um, and this is what Impossible Foods is gonna do. Okay, that's, a, that's for another conversation. And in that model, so there's obviously a lot of people employed in animal agriculture, what happens to the farmers, et cetera? All right, thank you so much for asking that question. Um, actually, one other thing that we uh, uncovered in doing this research is just kind of doing some other calculations from it is, um, whoops, my power is that bad. Sorry. Um, you can model, okay, the, 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 the carbon dioxide, forget about the methane nitrous oxide, which is, which is you know, equally impactful, but just from biomass recovery, which is something farmers could be involved in. Um, the, um, at carbon prices of, uh, pick a number, $100 a ton, which is where the World Bank projects that it's all hypothetical, they'll be in 2030. Um, how much money could you earn from your land doing this, just letting, helping the native ecosystem recover 
and selling carbon credits? Um, and the answer is for the vast majority of land, the, um, the money you could earn annually by doing that is far greater than what you're currently earning from uh, animal agriculture. And in fact, the dollar value per acre of the land for carbon capture is for the large majority of the land that's being used for animal agriculture is substantially greater. And in many cases, more than an order of magnitude greater than the price of the land um, currently. So that's a really interesting opportunity and um, that farmers are not aware of. They're basically sitting on a gold mine and chasing cows around when they should be mining gold. And mining gold means, you know, basically replanting the forests and ecosystems and selling the carbon credits. And they'll be doing a hell of a lot more good for the world. And it will be a better uh, living for the large majority of those farmers and better for the rural communities that they support, bringing in more income, more taxable income, and so forth, if they were to switch to that job. So, um, and this is, oh, this is just a map, um, just illustrating for the US what the dollar value is for carbon capture of animal ag land in various parts of the country. And just for comparison, when I say you can make a better living, um, the dollar value of the dollar, the average cost of an acre of, of land um, used for animal agriculture in the US today is about $1,200. So per hectare, that would be $3,000. And this chart, color-coded chart shows how much it, uh, uh, the total dollar value of the carbon it could capture at $100 a ton. Um, so that I think is a very interesting win-win opportunity uh, for farmers and rural communities. We, we did get, uh, we got a question here that uh, maybe speaks to this point. Uh, Nico Komen asks, is the dash line assuming recovery of 100% land area? Wouldn't- Yes, we... that's a very good question, yeah. Um, it's more spelled out in the paper, but yes, this is assuming that um, if you simply over a period of, in this model, I think uh, 30 years, um, essentially recovered the um, biomass um, that uh, was sort of like the pre-agricultural biomass. Um, that that's that was the assumption in the uh, in this model. And another. So yes, if if now if if you just if you just let's put it this way, suppose you can't make a living living raising cows. Uh, um, and and selling their products, okay? That itself is a bad outcome for those farmers. Um, but, you know, there would be an incentive, I would think, for them to make what would actually turn out to be a much better living um, actively being involved in, in uh, uh, restoring the healthy ecosystems uh, and preserving them. So, um, right now, there's no formal mechanism for that, but I think more and more governments and lots, there are companies right now that are actually paying $600 a ton to um, other companies for carbon capture. So the carbon market is, is very kind of chaotic and dysfunctional and so forth. But I would say there's, there's already demand. And when, when governments get closer to their promised deadline for addressing climate change and realize that they're a million miles away, I think that the carbon market is going to get a lot more lively and be a real, you know, opportunity for those farmers. Um, I did have another question or a couple of questions. You know, impossible has not been uh, without sorry, my dog is jumping on me, has not been without critiques. So for example, in a recent Times article, New York Times in October, it was asked, you know, it was said that if you don't, if you're not transparent about all of your supply chain, manufacturing processes, et cetera, how do any of us know, you know, that your, your model is sustainable or hits the numbers that, that you say it does? 
Um, what's your reaction to that critique? Well, I actually answered the question to that reporter who wasn't interested in publishing it, but we have been publishing, they're all on our website and we have more coming, uh, independent, independently done and audited life cycle analyses that look at the life cycle, meaning our entire supply chain from growing the crops, planting the crops, harvesting the crops, shipping them you know, to our site, the cost of the manufacturing process, the cost of our you know, distribution process, packaging, blah, 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 the whole shebang, full life cycle, independently audited by the, by the um, most respected life cycle analysis auditor out there. Um, they're on our website, okay? And what they show is that, for example, um, just take our, you know, you can, add, for, we do this for all of our products, okay? Um, so yes, we're being completely transparent about our whole life cycle, every single thing we do, the electricity we use for lighting our offices and running our plant and, you know, the fuel burned by the trucks that are shipping stuff and blah, 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 blah. And the bottom line is, when we compare that to the um, industry that we're replacing, and a very important point is that um, more than 90% of our customers are omnivores, current meat eaters. And our best estimate from receipt data is that at least 80% of our sales directly displace the sale of an animal product. In other words, our customers are not buying our meat products instead of lentils or uh, some you know, veggie burger, they're buying them instead of meat from an animal. Okay, we have objective data on this. So anyway, the point is, what matters is, what's the net environmental benefit? So we publish the data on what the actual, you know, life cycle impacts of our process. But what's more important is comparing it to um, the equivalent amount of, say, beef from a cow. And so for our current um, beef product, um, a pound of, you know, the impossible beef, producing it, life cycle, the whole shebang, distributing everything, supply chain, um, has a greenhouse gas footprint that is about 11 fold lower than that of a cow. We use less than 1 25th the land area and meaning land that can be covered by biomass and biodiversity. And we use um, one eighth the water and less than the 12th the fertilizer and pesticides and other agrochemicals in our, in our supply chain and in our life cycle compared to the product that we replace, okay? It's all on our website. We've been publishing it from day one and that reporter was smoking crack. <laughs> thank you, Pat. <laughs> uh, thank you, Pete, for the questions. Uh, let me uh, uh, follow up on a couple of the questions that uh, that Pete had asked for some uh, some of our viewers here. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Nico Komen's question uh, was really more about a hundred percent of that land that's used in um, for 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 agriculture uh, for meat production today not all of that would be able to return to its natural state because you still have to use some for growing the vegetables that go into the into the, the non the non meat products right so what percentage no, of that is no. going to the answer is no actually no? it's absolutely not here's a here's another fact that is is should be more widely known okay if you made the world's entire meat supply directly out of of plant crops you'd need to grow a lot less plant crops okay and I'll just give you one kind of uh, uh, illustrative factoid there. Um, this year's soybean crop, global soybean crop, first of all, this year's soybean crop in the US contains seven times as much total nutritionally equivalent protein as all the meat consumed annually in the US, okay? And the global soybean crop contains 50% more protein matched for quality, um, than all the meat consumed uh, globally. And that soybean crop occupies less than 1% of its land area, okay? So in fact, not only would you not need the land for grazing animals and for 
you know, housing them and all that kind of stuff, um, you would need less land growing crops because instead of turning the soybeans, in the case of a cow, with 3% efficiency into meat, you'd be turning the soy protein with 100% efficiency into meat. So, so it's actually, you know, I think in a way counterintuitive that you need less livestock and less plant crops to feed humanity. Thanks. So you would actually, yeah, you'd free up some of that uh, agricultural land today, in fact, by getting rid of meat. It was, absolutely. No human is eating all that vast amount of corn and soybeans that pretty much covers the uh, uh, upper Midwest. Mm -hmm. Now, I had a question. Um, in some sense, this is almost like a thought experiment because I don't. It doesn't seem likely to happen. Certainly, in the next fifteen years. Oh, I completely but, disagree. But we can debate that. Well, tell me why that it, it is likely, and also is there is an intermediate path that would be good for the climate as well, right? Any any partial accomplishment of this would be good for the climate, good for biodiversity and so forth. You know, we are just barely at the beginning. You know, we didn't even have a product in retail two years ago. We, we, we are at the very beginning of this process, but just to put it in perspective, um, we, um, uh, our sales, assuming the, um, you know, 80% uh, um, of them displace uh, the animal product, which is our, our best data suggests, um, we freed up an a, a land area um, equivalent to the uh, all of San Mateo County, okay? Um, so that's that's not 45% of Earth's surface, but um, that's meaningful in terms of uh, habitat and biodiversity. Of course, it wasn't all in San Mateo County, I mean, but, you know, in aggregate. And, um, and if we, uh, so if we just, if we accomplished half the goal, we'd, um, you know, to first approximation, not all agricultural land is equivalent for biodiversity and climate, but, um, you know, be halfway there. So yes, we'll, we'll um, uh, if necessary, settle for partial success, but I don't agree with you. I don't have this pessimistic view because actually that industry is way more fragile than people realize, okay? And, you know, to be blunt about it, what we're trying to do here um, is, very strategically pull the economic rug out from under the uh, global animal agriculture industry, okay? We're not here to sort of meticulously replace every single product they get. We are strategically looking at what are the economic pillars of that industry and deliberately going after them. So for example, in the US, um, uh, half and maybe more than half of all the beef produced in the US is sold as ground beef, okay? People think, oh, the, you know, uh, the real money makers are steak. Well, if you can't sell that ground beef, you're not profitable, no way. And by the way, the, the, live, the average income of a farmer or rancher in the beef industry, actually the median income, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics from, from uh, beef farming is a negative number, okay? Um, and uh, because it's, it's you know, uh, such a marginal business to be in. The slaughter, the slaughter cartel makes money, but the farmers barely make money. And, um, and, and the people who work in the slaughter cartel barely make money and they're in one of the most dangerous jobs on earth. But, but that industry is much more economically marginal than people realize. And their prices since Impossible was founded have doubled, okay? While our prices have come down by a factor of three uh, in just the past two and a half years because you know, we're getting economies of scale. So the winds of history are very much against them. And the world is for the first time, I went to Paris COP conference, nobody was talking about animal agriculture as a climate industry. When I went to uh, COP26, almost no one was talking about it, but most people were aware of it. And it was definitely a big part of the conversation and governments are becoming aware of it um, uh, and so forth. So um, I think that uh, not that awareness isn't gonna cause people to change their diets, but I think it is 
going to cause people to look a lot more uh, carefully at the economic incentives and um, for that industry and possibly consider that if you want to support rural communities and you want to guarantee a uh, stable livelihood to people currently in the animal ag industry, what you do is you offer to pay them for carbon capture. Don't compel it, but maybe you might want to offer that possibility. And uh, I think that's very likely to happen with some governments. In fact, I've, I've had conversations with people in the policy world in, in Europe and the US and so forth that I think consider that to be definitely something in the realm of worth consideration. So think of it this way. And, and on top of that, we have products that beat them on deliciousness. You know, um, our most recent product, Chicken Nuggets, which we just launched maybe a couple of months ago or something like that, um, is doing incredibly well. And why is that? Because every taste test we do, and we've done a number of them in the US and the UK and so forth, blind taste tests, they're preferred by an overwhelming majority of people over the best-selling animal chicken nuggets. In the US, we've done taste tests against McDonald's chicken nuggets, which is the best-selling food service chicken nuggets, and against uh, Tyson chicken nuggets, which are the best-selling retail chicken nuggets. And they've been preferred three to one over the animal versions, okay? And in fact, a lot of people say they taste more like chicken than the ones that are made from chicken. And the reason is it's not counterintuitive, it's that you know, the chicken isn't even trying to be delicious. And we are actually trying to make our products delicious. So when we're just as good and we've now surpassed the chicken, we can be even better because the better we understand what people consider delicious, we can dial it in. So the, everything is against them. The com competing technology, and the same is true of our beef and our pork product in, in Hong Kong in a blind taste test with 200 consumers, a substantial majority of them preferred it in a blind taste test over ground pork from a pig, okay? And Hong Kong people actually eat ground pork. So that means something. And that's the best selling meat uh, in the world, pork. So, so the point is from a technology standpoint, we have proof of concept and we're just getting started. Our technology is already beating them on the hard part, which is deliciousness. At scale, we'll beat them at, on cost, which is a huge driver. Um, we're better from a health and nutrition standpoint already. And, um, and they're not getting any better. And in fact, they're just going to be facing more and more headwinds. And I think this only ends one way. And that's what their demise. Well, you're, you're certainly have spurred competition too. And I want to ask you about that. You mentioned before uh, the, this conversation began, uh, the, the, uh, the cultured meat uh, alternative. And what is your what is your opinion? Is that also going to be uh, help the climate as well? Is that a is that a, a good alternative to um, using vegetable products? Yeah, it's not. It's it's a it's a joke. It's a joke. It's I, I'll just I'll try to do this really quickly because I I, I I I not much use in just dumping on them. But but basically, the economics at scale. I don't think anyone who's ever looked closely at it says that there's just no conceivable way that they will be economically competitive with um, the um, you know, current animal industry, nor with plant-based products, which are soon going to be cheaper than the animal-based products. Um, and anyone who's ever done cell culture at any scale um, understands this. Think of it this way. Suppose I said, here's how we're going to do it. You know, we're going we're gonna to take uh, an embryonic cow. We're going to um, wipe out its immune system we're going to um, put in the ICU and feed it intravenously for its entire life. And, and, uh, and then we're gonna turn it into meat, okay? You'd say, well, geez, ICUs are kind of expensive and boy, especially if you're immunodeficient, that could get kind of uh, complicated. Um, yeah, but that'd be easier than growing that uh, uh, cow meat from a stem cell, which is Im immunodeficient um, and uh, doesn't have the, the benefit of all the metabolic systems that a cow has for turning those raw nutrients into something that, that uh, uh, muscle tissue can use and so forth. And the other thing about the economics of it, just to, just to make this clear again, is that, is that suppose we had the ability to make any kind of a reasonable uh, replica of let's say animal muscle or, or some animal tissue, okay? Would, which would we do first? Would we try to sell it for $5 a pound in the meat counter or 
try to sell it for $500,000 a pound uh, for therapeutic applications, where actually having the ability to, you know, replace injured or dysfunctional human tissues would be way more highly valued than eating them or eating, eating cultured tissues. But that industry doesn't exist, okay? Because this is hard and uh, we're a million miles from it, okay? And the noise you get from those companies, it's just complete vaporware. So, um, and bless their hearts. I mean, they're, they're, many of them are on the same mission we're on. Some of them are just scammers, but, um, you know, but that's just the truth. And the other thing is this, okay? They missed the whole point. It's kind of like if you said 200 years ago, you know what, the horse is, is kind of maxed out as a power technology. You know, we got to come up with something better. Oh, genius idea. We're going to take horse muscle cells and grow them in culture and hook them up to gears and pulleys. And that's the power system of the future. You know, you'd have missed the whole opportunity because basically, you know, the issue there, no one says that, the, that anything having to do with power somehow has to trace back to that animal you've been using since prehistoric time. And the absolute same thing is true with uh, a meat, you know, once you step away from that, the sky's the limit, you know, you can actually make chicken nuggets that taste better than the chicken, okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, Peter had a, a question, she, he wanted to ask, uh, he had to step out uh, to get, let his dog out apparently, but uh, he was wondering about the saturated fats though that go into your products. Uh, are those an issue health-wise? Is it coconut milk? Oh. Uh, I don't know, or coconut fat uh, oil? Yeah. Well, let me address that, okay? Uh, and it's a very good question. So um, there's, there's pretty reasonable ev evidence that a high proportion of saturated fats in your diet is net negative from a health standpoint. I would say it's, if you look at the, you know, Cochrane reviews, which is what kind of my go-to, it's the, nonprofit that does a lot of systematic reviews of all the evidence on big health topics. It's not a slam dunk, but I'm convinced that saturated fats um, are, are, you know, um, best kept to a minimum. But our task here is not to make a food that um, can be your entire diet. It's not to make a food that you can uh, choose instead of a lentil salad, okay? It's to make a food that is explicitly intended to displace an animal product from your diet. So let's look at it from that perspective. And from that perspective, we're um, absolutely doing, doing uh, the right thing in the sense that our products are lower in calorie than the product they replace. So like our burger is lower calorie than 80-20 than ground beef, which is the large majority of all ground beef sold in the US. Um, it's lower total fat, I think like, um, I'm gonna try to look it up because I, um, I didn't have that ready for this, but um, it's uh, so, Total fat, our burger is 14 grams per uh, 100 grams. The cow burger is 23 grams of fat per 100 grams. Saturated fat, our burger has eight grams and the cow burger 80-20 has nine grams of saturated fat. Ours has zero grams of cholesterol. Their, theirs has 80 milligrams of cholesterol, which is significant. And um, ours has zero fecal bacteria. Um, unlike every single pound of fecal bacteria, every single pound of ground beef sold in grocery stores based on a study that was published a few years ago, 300 out of 300 samples from dozens of grocery stores, 100% of them contain fecal bacteria. We decided to leave the fecal bacteria out of our recipe. So um, I think from a nutrition and health standpoint, we've done what's important, which is that we have, we have made a product that is in meaningful ways, healthier than what it re replaces. By the way, same protein content, same protein quality, same bioavailable iron, same essential micronutrients and so forth. So um, yes, it does contain saturated fat. We're actually working very hard to reduce uh, uh, that saturated fat. But um, the issue there is that in order to get the fat texture and mouthfeel that is important for consumers, 
um, you need to uh, get the melting point to a certain uh, level. And, um, and also you need to get the smoke point high enough so that you don't get two tons of smoke when you cook it. And those require some saturated fat uh, and uh, right now, but we find a, found a way to make our product do those things with less saturated fat than the cow version. So I think um, it's progress, but we're working hard and making progress on making it better every single day. And that's, that's a big part of our research. Um, what, one person had a question, brother. What, what is the, the, when do you predict the, 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 the crossover where, where a non-meat um, burger will be less expensive than a, a, a beef burger? Well, as I said, kind of like the economics are structurally better. It's just inevitable. Like I say, less land, less water, less agricultural inputs, less labor on the farm, less labor in the factory and so forth. Um, our, our cost of production has come down by threefold in the past roughly two and a half years, okay? And that's mostly because of scale. Um, also other, other things, you know, improvements in our supply chain and process and ef manufacturing efficiency and stuff like that. But, um, but I would say absolutely within a few years, and actually the, the animal industry is helping us there because their prices are steadily going up. Like I say, they've doubled since Impossible was founded. So I think we're certainly within a few years of that crossing point and it'll be faster depending, it just depends on how fast we can scale because a lot of this really is, it sounds trite, is just economies of scale. Um, and, and also the fact that we're building our infrastructure in real time as we're operating and so forth. And, Basically, theirs was built mostly 100 years ago. So, um, you know, uh, um, but I'd say within a few years. I can't really give you an accurate position. So, so many things over which we have no control that go into that. Uh, final question. I think we need to wrap up. But the question is, what about impossible seafood? Are you uh, coming out with some of that? We've actually done experiments on seafood uh, in R&D and, and, you know, quite interesting, encouraging results. Um, we, because we're still, uh, you know, a uh, small but mighty company, um, we're, you know, we're being very deliberate about how we prioritize our research. And so we've done like, you know, experiments on a small scale, figuring out the flavor chemistry, which we've done a reasonable job. I think we're pretty far along, you know, I think quite far along in understanding the flavor chemistry of, of uh, fish, uh, um, less far along in understanding the, the flavor chemistry of crustaceans and so forth, but um, but done work on that. But in terms of actually productizing it, that that is um, a whole nother level of work that, because you require, you know, figuring out how to scale and all that sort of stuff, it's probably going to be maybe a couple of years before we have a product ready to launch in, in that space, but it's definitely gonna happen. It's absolutely on our trajectory. In fact, I would say, you know, from an impact standpoint, number one is take down the cow, no brainer. Um, just get rid of uh, essentially cows um, and you are, you know, like approximately 80% of the way to achieving the climate benefits of the whole shebang. From biodiversity standpoint, um, the oceans, are a disaster. Um, it's all due to overfishing, essentially all. The rest is due to runoff from animal agriculture. So, you know, either way, but um, but overwhelmingly due to overfishing, and even the plastic pollution in the ocean, less widely known, but the the overwhelming source of plastic pollution is fishing nets and fishing lines. Um, by mass, it's about half of all the plastic in the ocean is is discards from the fishing industry, by impact, it's even more because, because that plastic is designed to be to last a long time in the ocean and to catch fish. So in terms of the damage it does to marine species, it's way up on the top of the list. So that industry has to go and the sooner the better or we're in deep doo-doo. 
And um, uh, so they're definitely on our target list. And like I'd say they're basically right behind the cow in terms of environmental impact. Um, so it's, it's, it's coming. Okay. And it's not fundamentally more difficult. It's just, it's just there are some different uh, uh, features of texture and flavor and so forth that, that are, um, need to be solved. Well, we'll have to wait for a few years for that product to appear on the market. Um, thank you very much, Pat Brown. Thanks, Pete, for uh, for engaging him in conversation and bringing out a lot of the uh, the new science uh, from his recent paper and also the science from Impossible Foods. Uh, I want to thank everybody else uh, for tuning in and. Um,